Hello and welcome. In this video, we show you how to take a problem in words and prepare a primitive flow table. And these problems mostly involve asynchronous flip-flops. So our problem for today is a toggle flip-flop. And this flip-flop changes its output state on the negative transition of the clock pulse. So we have two inputs and an output. We have the toggle input, which is either 0 or 1. 0 means do nothing, no toggle. And 1 means that every time we get a clock pulse, the output will change state. If it was a 1, it will become a 0. If it was a 0, it will become a 1 when the clock goes negative. Got that? If not, you can go back and listen to it slowly. And uh, once you've got that idea, then we can proceed. Now, what we want to do is we want to draw a total state diagram. These total state diagrams have both your outputs and your inputs as the total state. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the zeros and ones in the order with the Q output first, then the toggle, state of the toggle input, and then finally the state of the clock input. So when we say 0, 0, 0, that means we have 0 output, 0 on the T or toggle input, and 0 on the C or clock input or a low clock, if you prefer to think of it in terms of low and high. So when we're in that state, we're perfectly stable, and we can move away from that state by either making the C a 1 or the T a 1. So with each of these states, we have two possible ways to go. We can either change the T, or we can change the C, and this is bas basically the fundamental mode operation of the asynchronous sequential circuit. Fundamental mode simply means that we can only change one input at a time and wait for the output to settle. Now, we have the backlinks there, and why do we have the backlinks? Because if we make the C a 1, or if we make the T a 1, we can always go backwards and make it back a 0. We can go back to 0. So from both of those, we can perfectly easily go back to 0. Now we add this state which means that if we're either in the 0, 0, 1 or the 0, 1, 0, then the next state is going to be 0, 1, 1. We can make the T a 1 or we can make the C a 1 to end up with two ones on the input. Now, if we do that, what are the next two possible states? Well, it turns out I can always lower the T back to zero, in which case I just go back to my zero, zero, one. But if I lower the C, I take the red arrow. Now, what does the red arrow signify? Well, notice that the toggle is a 1, and if I take the low, in other words, if my clock goes low, then the output is going to change. So the red arrow signifies that now, at this point, my output is going to change from a 0 to a 1. Why is it going to change? It's going to change because... The toggle input is high, which means I can toggle. And two, the negative transition is occurring. The clock is going from a 1 to a 0. 
And when that happens, my output is going to change. So, the next state that I have to draw is 110. My output has changed from a 0 to a 1, and my clock has gone from a 1 to a 0, which is the negative transition we were talking about. That should be fairly obvious if you study that. So what's the next thing we can do? Well, the next thing we can do, uh, one of the next things we can do is to make the clock go high again. And remember, nothing really happens if the clock goes high, so I just go from 110 to 111. But if... I do that and the clock happens to go low. If the clock goes low, then because the toggle is still high, that one is going to go back to a zero as shown there. So basically, if you follow those Z ar um, red arrows, you will see that the two red arrows change the output from a zero to a one and from a 1 back to a 0. So make sure you follow that. And there I have filled in the other two states where the output is a 1. Now clearly I can put the toggle back to a 0 at any time, which is what I'm doing to go from 6 to 4 or from 7 to 5. All that's happened is that I'm putting the toggle back to a 0. And I have that option and it's reversible. So I can put it to a 0 and then I can put it back to a 1. I can also swing between the 4 and the 5. Notice between the 4 and the 5. I can swing between the 4 and the 5. Why? Because the clock can merrily go from a 0 to a 1 or a 1 back to a 0 as long as the toggle input is 0. So the only time the output's going to change is when the toggle is a 1. The toggle input is a 1. Make sure you understand that. So spend some time studying this diagram. Watch the video over and over, listen carefully to what I say, make some notes, and then be totally happy that this diagram is correct. What do we do next? Well, we know that we can number these, or should we say, label these states with letters, and we need to do that. So we've chosen the letters A to H. Now, why have we put the A on 3, 0, 1, 1? Well, that's the beginning of where the action starts to happen. The action goes when we go from A to B, when the, the toggle is a 1 and the clock goes from a 1 to a 0. And the action continues to happen as we go through B, C, and D. So basically from A to D is a continuous sweep. The arrows follow in a continuous direction, and that in fact is the active cycle in the sense that we go from a 0 to a 1, and then from a 1 to a 0 as we get two transitions of the clock pulse. We then proceed in a clockwise fashion to number, or should we say label, the remaining state. So we go EF and GH for those states where we're happy to remain with the same output. Now having done that, we want to put those eight stable states onto a primitive flow table. A primitive flow table has the inputs along the top, TC, toggle and clock, 
and it has the various states down the side from A to H. Now, obviously, the A state is going to have its output and its inputs as shown. We have 0, 1, 1, which is the A state. So we put A0 under the 1, 1 input, and we circle it because we're in the A row. So we continue to put the eight states of our total state diagram onto our flow table as shown. Notice two things. Notice that there's only one stable state per row. And notice also that we have a don't care square in every row. Because when we're in a stable state, we can only move to the left or to the right. We will never reach those squares ever. We never ever reach those squares that are marked dash, comma, dash. Which means we truly do not care what's in those squares at all. Now look what I've done here. I've brought back my diagram with my various states A to H so that you may see how I decide what to put into the other squares on my primitive flow table. In the A row, if I'm in the A state, what are my options? As I previously pointed out, I only have two ways to escape from the A state. Now, based on the arrows you see in my, di in my diagram, one would be to go from the A to the B, and the other would be to go from the A to the F. And I go from the A to the B when the T and the C are one zero. And I go from the A to the F when the T and the C are zero one. As shown. So if you follow down through all the other rows, you will see that I have just followed the pattern. To take one more example. When I am in the D state, I can possibly move to the E state, as shown by the arrow, or from the D state, I could move to the A state. So I can either go to the E or I can go to the A when I'm in the D state. But if I'm going to the A, then my input TC is going to be 1, 1, as shown. And if I'm going to the E, then my input is going to be 0, 0, as shown. So a little careful studying of these two diagrams, and you should be able to do it for yourself. Now notice that I have not bothered to write the output on the various transitions. I have just written a dash, and the only place where the output is shown is in the stable conditions. This is a good practice because it will allow us to optimize our output state assignment at the end. But for now, you should know how to go from a worded problem to a primitive flow table. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.